So Ecclesiastes chapter 7, we, we got through 7 verse 1 last week. You know, Solomon is seeking to find the meaning of life under the sun, apart from God, and he has invested all kinds of time all kinds of resources and money he's got all of that stuff to spend and and so far he hasn't found good results you know uh, his overwhelming conclusion so far it's all vanity it's all emptiness it's it's very very frustrating to see all the issues in life not be able to solve them and so last week we came to chapter 7 and in chapter 7 the tone of the book changes uh, he does what every thinking person does that wants to live life down here on planet earth without God you know who rejects God's morality rejects his instruction rejects his wisdom they come up with their own philosophy of life well this is what I've found as I go through life you know you've, you've talked to a few people like that and uh, some of what he brings up is right on it's it's very true and some of what he brings up is way out there in left field and you wonder where where he got it you know so Solomon's going to share his philosophy with us through chapter 7 through almost the end of the book uh, some of what he says you know like I said he stumbled across some truth some of what he says you know he hasn't stumbled across the truth and yet all of it is incomplete uh, that's the problem he he la lays out this philosophy in these various sections almost like quotes from his life you know and then for us we simply need to ask a couple of follow-on questions and it'll it'll really get you there we should be asking yes yeah, Solomon I get that but why do you think that way why do you why have you come to that position that belief why is this life that way Solomon stops short you know just on the other side of those questions um, you could have a face to face with God he's gonna meet you right there but he just stops short of asking those pertinent questions you know people all around the world who have kicked God to the curb and and want to try their own thing down here they develop their philosophy but they always stop a question or two short those questions are the deep questions those are the questions you really need answers for and this exposes the flaws in our philosophy and it calls us to follow God's wisdom so we left off in chapter 7 verse 1 so let's pick it up in 7 verse 2 he says in chapter 7 verse 2 better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting for that is the end of all men and the living take it to heart it's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party that is what he's saying here you know this is my go-to passage for funerals I I take almost all funerals to this passage because one day we're all going to attend a funeral it's probably the last one we will attend because we're going to be in the box or in the urn or in the clay pot or you know we're going to be in the memory of the people that that show up uh, and it's interesting to just sit in funerals and think you know my mother I grew up with a professional funeral grower and she went to every funeral I think in the world but I didn't know these people uh, she, she heard their name oh I think I know them and boom, off we would go and you know I got drugged every funeral in the world and uh, I always hated them because I'm an emotional kid and I, I'm one of those if I see somebody crying I want to cry you know I, I want to join in and that was never a comfortable thing for me so I, I didn't know these people I didn't like most of them and I could care less and yet I it would tear me apart you know so it probably wasn't until I did my son Ryan's funeral that I actually got a little bit of handle on my emotions and uh, you know I still 
you know, weep with the weepers and and rejoice with the rejoicers. But uh, it's a whole lot different now. Anyways, it's good in this life to go to a place where you actually contemplate what happens at the end of life. You know, where are we going? Where am I going? What comes after death? What comes after life? What, why is there death? You should ask all of these questions. You should know these answers, you know. But there are some, you know, who don't want to go there at all. So they, they skip the funeral and go, you know, I'm going to go toast this guy at the bar, you know. And, you know, just ignore it, going out to the party life and never consider where they're headed, how they're going to get there, or what happens at the end of this life. He says in verse 3, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of myrrh. Mirth, mirth. I can't say that word. Um, the heart of the wise is the one that goes to the funeral. I think that's interesting. And thinks about, actually engages what's going to happen there. But the heart of the fools, they're checking out the party scene. They spend their entire life trying to ignore the reality of death. And I don't know if you've ever picked this up, but death refuses to be ignored. Oh, it refuses. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come in. Um, weddings and funerals are the two big deals for most pastors and you know I find weddings frustrating and fun and interesting you know I, I, I think it's fun to have two people kind of fall towards each other and they just go get all googly eyed and they look at each other oh we can't wait to spend the rest of our lives together and all I can see is two sinners thinking they're going to get in the same house and get along you know good luck with this right so I like to share a little wisdom a little stuff that I've picked up or that the Lord has told me you know things I wished I would have known going into that that place but funerals on the other hand have this air about them there's mourning there's loss there's emotion you know there's there's some hard and yet fascinating things that happen there and many people are really reachable when there's a death because they're thinking they're engaging you know, when, when dad dies or grandpa dies or mom or little brother or whoever it is, you know. For me, many times at a funeral, I only know one little section of the crowd. I just know this family or I just know that half or sometimes I've only known one person and it was the one in the box, you know. And know anybody else in the whole place. They just called me because dad said he liked you, so would you come, you know. <laughs> And I get to share with them about the realities of death. I get to be this that brings up why. Why is there death? How's it overcome? Where are you headed? You know, I get to go through all of those things. So parties are people trying to avoid realities, but funerals force realities upon us. It's the crowbar experience, and sometimes you need a little crowbar, you know, in your life. And of course, the Bible is the only place that supplies all the answers to those questions. And I know some, some other religions look at you and smile and they go, well, that's wrong. No, that's right. You, you may have some issues, some answers. You don't have them all, like the Bible says. So Solomon says, only a fool goes through life without giving real thought to death. Isn't that funny? Only a fool. He says those words, you know. Only a fool doesn't engage in this, you know, about death's existence, about its origin, about how to prepare for it. And you will notice Solomon stopped short of asking those questions also, right? 
You know, if I'm determined to live life without God, then I'm always going to stop one or two steps back from the real depth things. Because any ultimate truth is going to subject me to coming face to face with God. Because he has the answers. He says in verse 5, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. <laughs> it's better a wise rebuker than the praise song of a fool. Verse 6, For like crackling thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. This also is vanity. The crackling of thorns on fire under a pot what you've got to you know we don't have many thorns around here we you know rose bushes i guess or something but but in the middle east they're, they're thorns they got lots of bushes with thorns on them but they're very dry and they're very little skinny and you use those for like kindling right so they flame up really fast <laughs> snapping and crackling and popping and then in a moment they're gone Here's a guy trying to heat up his stew. You know, he's got this big iron pot and he throws some thorns under there. That, that's not never going to heat it up because it's, it's a flash in the pan kind of a thing. It's exactly what the praise of a fool is like. It's a flash in the pan. Oh, it was hot and sparkly and ooh, heat for a moment, but then, ooh, then it's gone. It's the same with laughter of a fool. How many people have you had laugh at you because of your belief? Oh, you're one of them Jesus freaks. Oh, you're one of them people who read the book. You believe that book? Oh, man. <laughs> it lasts this long and they're gone. Doesn't matter to me. You know, I've been laughed at a lot. But oh, the constructive criticism of a wise person. It accomplishes much. So are you the kind of person that can be rebuked? That's, the, that's what he's asking here. Are you the, the wise or the fool? Are you the guy who wants to hear the applause of the unwise, you know, that's here for a moment and gone? Or are you the person that wants to actually grow and learn and get through life, you know? Some people just can't stand to be rebuked or corrected. They're never open to wisdom or instruction or growth. They would rather have the praise of fools, and that person will never get anywhere in this life. Anyone who has ever become anything in life, and especially it's true in the kingdom of God, is a person that allows others to come alongside of them and inject wisdom instruction guidance depth you know the ability to change and rethink how what why you know let me change these things let me let me pick your brain you know i've been an artist since i was like i don't know seven years old you want a tough field to be somebody in be an artist because everybody has an opinion everybody and you had to learn very young to take constructive criticism. Constructive criticism is great. Why made you? Why'd you draw the horse like that? Why is he ha his head looking like that? You know, something's not right. You, you got to figure that out. You know, it was it was funny because I became a security inspector out at the site and carried a gun and learned tactics and learned to be a hostage negotiator and learned how to shoot and respond and work through a crisis and you know. You had to learn all of that stuff. You had to be taught. You had to listen to people that have actually done this and, and learn through it. I, I, I work on old cars. So I would go hang out with my brother. He was a body man, and I learned how to do body work by watching my brother, you know? And I would ask him questions, and he would, well, that's stupid. Why would you do that? Do it like this, you know? And I'm like, oh, oh, you know? Or to do paint or upholstery or any of the things that I've ever learned how to do. You know, I began by failing and failing and failing again and then receiving instruction 
And once you fail, the instruction just comes right in. Oh, that's how you do that. You know, it's great that way. Verse 7, surely oppression destroys a wise man's reason and a bribe debases the heart. Don't ever trade your good character for, for the opportunity to oppress people whom you have power over or authority over. That's a sure way to destroy your character. Anytime you have the upper hand in a situation and then you use that upper hand to put others down or to build yourself up, <laughs> uh, people will see that and they will remember that forever, right? Equally harmful is when people think they, is when you think somebody has good character and then you catch them taking a bribe being paid off you know the idea that you can be bought just ruins your character verse 8 the end of a thing is better than its beginning and patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit Solomon speaking here of the importance of patience or self-control so many things take longer and cost more time and more energy than we think they're going to. <laughs> so many things in life get harder before they get better. His advice, keep your focus on the better thing that you're working towards. It's coming. You're, you're chipping away at it. You're going to get there. Not on the present hardships you're going through. Be confident that if you are doing the right things, then it's going to have a good ending, right? Now, he's speaking of the world, and we have God on our side, you know. He says, the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. You ever been there? You get around somebody and they're going through some circumstance. I can't believe this is going on with me. I am better than this. I, I'm too good to be in this situation. You know, that's pride talking. I don't have time to mess around with a trial like this. I've got work that needs to be done that, that demands my attention. I got news for you. You know, if, if you get a big problem, it's demanding your attention. God has a way of just interjecting stuff into your life to kind of get your attention. Uh, I'm too important. I'm too big. I'm too proud to be kept back by these difficulties. Oh, brother, God uses all things to train us and to grow us and to direct us. This is the process of life down here on planet earth and you're never too big or too important for him to take a little time and deal with you keep that in mind right verse 9 do not hasten in your spirit to be angry for anger rests in the bosom of fools <laughs> don't rush in and respond in anger hmm. I, only behind the wheel right it only happens when I'm driving on hit road. It, uh, you know, he says, slow down and respond in wisdom, not in anger. Some people have that short fuse. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody like that, you know. They have this little tiny short fuse and then, you know, everything explodes. Notice what he says here. Don't do that because why? Because anger rests in the bosom of fools. It finds a home there. Anger just, oh, I can hang out here because, oh, he, he wants to use me, you know. They say that you can judge the size of a man by what it takes to get him to lose it. <laughs> Oh, I have had my opportunities to be this small, you know? Just the stupidest little things. And next thing you know, there's tools flying and curse words coming out and stuff's going on and all the kids run, you know? I don't know if you ever did that, but, you know, when I was, a, when I was younger, I still had kids, but when I was younger, you know, if the hood came up on a car, 
within about 10 minutes, there were stuff going on under that. And all the kids would run in the house. I'm like, where's my helper going? Yeah, well, they're, they're scattered for safety, you know. I'm so glad that the, the Lord has grown me in that area, you know. Didn't used to take much to throw me over the edge. Verse 10, do not say, why were the former days better than these? Oh, the good old days, right? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. I, I love this. Do you remember the good old days? Uh, don't dwell in the past. Live in the present. Older people can struggle here because we have a lot of good old days, right? But it's mostly because we have a vivid imagination and a poor memory. You know? We gloss over all the hard things that we were going through. And we just remember the good parts. We can so easily do this when we look around our country sometimes. Hmm. You know, we, we compare where we are today with where the country was 60 or 100 years ago. The moral decline, the state of the government, character, people in general, where their heart is and, and how they act. And we see this trending downward thing. You know, I call it the slickery slide. You know, I grew up with Hillview uh, School in Ammon, right in my backyard. And they had this slickery slide at the, at the far end of the playground. And I remember it was so tall, I used to get scared getting on top of it. But it was one of them fast ones. It was, whew, you're off. And, and that's, that's my opinion of what's going on today, you know. But we, we shouldn't panic that it's trending down. Because, you know, life does this, trends down, then trends up, then trends down, you know. Seems like we're taking a lot of downward trends. It is. Stop living so much in your past and failing to enjoy your present I don't know about you, but my todays are simply amazing. What God is doing with me and in me and through me and, and for me and just the blessed life that I live. Uh, I can remember back, you know, before I was 60, when I was like 30. And I can remember actually being able to do a few things. Oh, I used to go do this, and I could do that, and if I saw that, I could make that happen. And, you know, I, I, I do. I remember those times, but I also remember I couldn't rub two dimes together to save my life, you know? So, bottom line is, yesterday is gone. And you will never, ever be able to bring it back again, especially by looking back and complaining about today. No, learn to live in today. But as a Christian, I hope you do notice the spiritual decline in the neighborhood, you know, in America, the moral depravity. So then what should our response be? Man, dive in. Man, the, the field is ripe for harvest, but the laborers are few. You know, share Jesus, pray for the nation, pray for the world, use your gifting, your calling. Try to reverse the direction just in your little group. And even with that, we still must live in the present. Oh, one day it's going to be like this, or it used to be like this. Quit living out there and live here. You know, today matters, and that's what Solomon is saying. Verse 11, wisdom is good with an inheritance and profitable to those who see the sun. <laughs> the value of wisdom, perhaps especially if and when you have received an inheritance. Oh, the wonders of youth, right? You ever see someone pretty young and, and they receive an inheritance, a, a big sum? So they get the check on Monday morning, and by Friday, it's parked in the driveway. The inheritance is, you know. 
Um, or it's installed in the game room downstairs, you know, that kind of thing. It might also mean that wisdom is better than an inheritance of money. And that's an important truth, you know. If all you're leaving your kids is a dollar sign, is some bank account, I feel sorry for your kids. We should leave them spiritual riches. We should leave them salvation, a good name, godly character, wisdom. You know, we should be leaving them something that actually matters. Solomon says, wisdom over money every time you should pick it. And he was an expert in both of these. God calls him the wisest man to ever live. So he knew something about wisdom. And he also, you know, was quite wealthy. Wisdom is, is a better protection for people than money is. Because you can lose the farm overnight. You can wake up one day and something's happened in the nation and phew, the money is gone. But when you possess wisdom, nobody can take that from you. It's in you. You've got that for life. So, it says in verse 13, <clears throat> Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what he has made crooked? <laughs> in the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. We've got to understand that we're not in control of life. I, some of you guys know that. Some of you guys are still figuring that out. You know, How do you deal with the fact that God works in mysterious ways and sometimes he reaches in and he shakes your little tree. He changes your direction. He, he, he does something, you know, and, and we sit back and we wonder, is this a, a test? Is it a trial? Is it a triumph? Well, well, you know, all we know is here it comes. Oh no, <laughs> Boy, here we go. How's this gonna work out? And who can win, win the battle with him? Oh, I'm not going to take it. I'm, I'm going to reject that one, Lord. You, you take it back. You know, who, whoever does that. I know I've never done that, you know. God brings the good times to your life, and I love those times. And he brings the hard times to your life, and I grow through those times. It's not grown, although that may be involved. I grow through those times. Solomon's advice, man, enjoy the good times and the good things. Enjoy the prosperous times. You know, God has given us all things to enjoy. We should do that. But also learn that adversity comes to us all. It's part of life and there's nothing you can do about it. We don't always know what he's doing. We can't see the ending, you know. But as a Christian, we should know one thing. Romans 8, 28. And we know, do you know? And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Why the test? Why the trial? Why the sickness? Why the hard times? Why this stuff coming on? Because you're being conformed into an image. You're not just being taken to heaven. You're being conformed into an image. And that image is Christ. That's a lot of conforming for a guy like me. God has used everything in my life, good times and hard times. And I remember losing it all, basically. You know, I kind of got fired from a job and didn't have any income. We had to sell our car. We were living in a little shack and just kids hungry and going crazy. We lost it all. God used that time, you know. I remember 
the car wreck that we were in 20 years ago this year. I remember the death of my son. You know, he's still using things like this struggling little church. He's using my brain injury. You know, all things. But it all has purpose far beyond what I can see him doing because it's conforming me. Now this next section, uh, Solomon's advice, <laughs> it's learn to live right in the middle of life. Don't be so wicked that you stand out and don't be so righteous that you stand out. Don't be ov overly anything. And he's going to use that overly, you know. He, he's going to repeat it three times in four verses here. He says in verse 15, I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. This way righteous dude he was amazing. He was a great guy, and he just up and died, just like that. Boom. And then there was this scoundrel, you know, the drug king of the neighborhood kind of guy. And he's, gonna, he's dying of old age now. He's been around forever. People we think should live a long time don't necessarily do that. And people we think shouldn't never die, you know? And we can't make sense of it. Solomon's sitting here struggling with the idea. The people I think should die are still here, and the people I think God should leave around forever are gone. What's going on? You can't judge life that way, and Solomon's struggling with that. He says in verse 16, do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? <laughs> Why are you killing yourself to be overly righteous or overly wise? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Don't go the other way either. Don't be overly wicked. Don't be just a, an idiot, you know, out there being the fool. Verse 18, it is good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other for he who fears God will escape them all. You cannot figure this world out. Who's going to live or who's going to die? You would think God would always bless the righteous and, and he would be cursing the wicked and so it would all work out, you know, through this life. But remember, he is explaining life under the sun. He kind of removes God out of the picture and he's trying to look at life and he goes, this, this isn't making any sense with my morality system, with the way I think. With my, my thought of justice and equity and righteousness, you know, it's not working out. Without God, this life is cruel. This life is miserable. This life is like a bad joke because it's so unfair on so many levels. There's so much suffering going on to good people, if you will. And Solomon's struggling with life because he feels like righteousness should always be rewarded and wickedness should always be punished. So we should be able to see what's going on. It should be a right and wrong system. And I don't know if you know this, but it doesn't work that way out in life. You know, I remember those tough lessons. Life is not fair. This life down here, definitely not fair. You know? Now, he can't go to the place that we can go to. We know that ultimately, every event in this world will be dealt with. <laughs> Many things that are never squared away in this life, oh, one day they're going to be squared away. You know, 
in that life to come. You know, many places down here, the only reward for living a godly life is persecution and difficulty because you're bringing it on yourself. You've lived so righteously and so godly that now you're a, people are pointing at you and, and you're standing out in the crowd and they're going to pick on you. Things are going to happen to you because you've made yourself a target. Why would you do that, Solomon says? Oh, there's reasons, right? And in life under the sun, there isn't any of those reasons. No thought of a heavenly reward. So why would you do it? But Solomon can't ask the question, can he? He's under the sun. He can't ask that question. What, what's the question? You know, Paul will tell us in, in Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He says in verse 16, going back, he says, Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Because there's no set formula for what is righteous or what, what righteous brings, what righteousness brings, or what evil brings in this life, then it's best to avoid standing out in either one of those two categories, you know? Don't be overly anything. You're going to live longer. You're going to be able to fly under the radar. Just mind your own business. Solomon is so far off base. So far. What is life without a goal, without trying to excel, especially for Christians? I want to do better today than I did yesterday. I want to put a bigger smile on the Lord's face this week than I did last week. You know, in Matthew 5, 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men. Stand out, right? Let your life so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are to stand out. And we're to stand out further than we want to. In Luke 8, 16, it says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but he sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see its light. Jesus has lit you up. You are now, you know, he called himself the light of the world, and then he turned to you and he said, Now you are the light of the world and it's literally you and you alone are the light of the world and he did not light you to have you hide yourself under this vessel or under a bed or in a closet he lit you to put you on a on a lampstand on a lamp post somewhere out there in public so that light would shine all around so everybody that's around you would see that light <laughs> that's standing out <laughs> even if that means I get mocked I get made fun of I get called little Bible boy you know whatever it is the most important thing for a Christian isn't mortal longevity. It isn't this long life. It's pleasing God. It's pleasing the one who gave me life. We know that this isn't all there is. Right? This 60, 70, 90 years, whatever we get. So our priorities are different than Solomon's were. You can live a long life and not really live at all. And I've met some people like that. You know, Jim Elliott said, We have only one life to live. It will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Yeah. Verse 19. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city. Wisdom is... Wisdom in a person is, great, is a greater source of strength than any political power or armed might. Verse 20, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Solomon's catching a few pointers here because this one's right on. 
everyone is a sinner. There is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's literally all have sinned and continually are falling short of the glory of God daily, moment by moment. But what he doesn't ask is the next question, why is everyone a sinner? Because that's going to bring him face to face with God, because that's going to take him back to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Here's the creation. Everything is perfect. God gets done with creation, and he goes, man, that's good. That is really, really good. And the next chapter, the fall, and he has to kick them out of the garden, and he has to, you know, put angels there to guard the way to the tree of life and, you know, do all of this stuff because separation took place, because sin took place, because a huge fall in our nature, in our character, in creation took place. But he can't go there, so he doesn't go there. Why, why is everybody so sinful? Why is everything so bad? Because you won't ask the next question, you know? How'd that happen? Oh, happened in Genesis chapter 3. You know, verse 21, also do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. This is a good piece of counsel here, you know, especially for hypersensitive people. Don't let it gain a foothold in your heart and eat away at you. He looked at me bad. He said that word and he had that look in his eyes and he, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I have one of those faces. My wife tells me about my face sometimes. You got that face on. What, what face is that? Mark's face? Yeah. I worked 50 years to get this face the way it is, you know? And sometimes I'm just walking around and I got the grump look, you know? I got that brr, mean, angry, grumpy bear look you know and somebody will ask me something I've had little kids come up and and say something and I look at them and they turn around and run to mom mom it was mean to me you know and I'm like I didn't do anything I was just standing there you know thinking about what they said it's a big mistake to read people like that and it's a big mistake to take every word anybody says right into your heart so the exhortation is to not be overly sensitive or take words too seriously that you may catch wind of, you know? Why? Because we've all done it. We've all done this. We've all spoken wrongly about somebody in, in the presence of somebody else, you know? One of the ways we have to deal with the, with other people's shortcomings is to understand that what's in them is probably in me. <laughs> I have the same issues they have. Now, when I became a pastor, I had all the issues. You know, <laughs> God called me out of the gutter and he says, now I want you to counsel people and get to know them. And, you know, people would come into me and, and want counseling. Oh, Mark, I'm struggling with the alcohol. Oh, me too. You know, and they would look at you. You too. Oh, man, I, I had a, we had some, we had some times, you know. Oh, Mark, you know, my language, my language is just, and I'm like, oh, man, me too, you know. And people would go, how can a pastor be saved? Well, you know, God saves us from the guttermost, you know. I mean, from the uttermost to the uttermost. How is that going? Yeah, I'm one of those people, you know. The older I get, the more compassion I have towards other people who fail and blow it because I have a long, steady track record of failing and blowing it, you know, big time. So I, I don't get too upset at most things that happen, you know. I simply want to be a blessing to them. I, I want to draw them, give them some comfort, you know, because God was so long suffering towards me. How can I not give others a break when it comes to those things? So 
Solomon expresses his disappointment with man. He, he's going to get into this next section. He's going to express his disappointment with man as a whole. Ever been there? <sighs> Everybody's letting me down, and I can't find any good people. And I, uh, you know, he, he's going through this thing, and he's going to start with women. So we're just going to skip that section. I, I don't want any shots, you know. I don't want to get any emails, you know. We just skip that and move on. Well, I guess maybe we better not. Verse 23, he says, All this I have proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? I applied my heart to know, to search and seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly even the foolishness and the madness and i find more bitter than death the woman that woman whose heart is a snare and nets whose hands are fetters he who pleases god shall escape from her but the sinner shall be trapped by her he starts to sharpen his point probably pointing at the prostitution kind of thing you know women out there seducing men i think it's it's hilarious that women in the bible are never warned about men they're smart enough to understand that's that's a guy you know but men are warned constantly about women because we're like oh she's pretty yeah hang on you know there's some depth in there somewhere you know his idea here is that the only person that's ever going to be able to escape her trap her clutches is one who knows god remember he's trying to leave god out of this but everybody else is going to be easy pickings for her they're just going to play right into her hand everything you know so in his high and lofty place that he's built I have my standards and my ethics and my righteousness and my stuff. You know, he looks down on this woman and her sin. Usually the sins that we think are the worst are the ones we are so attracted to. <laughs> We're just this far away from doing and, and to watch somebody else do it, it's like, oh, how did they get away with that? And, oh, 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 you know. It's usually the very things I struggle with, the things that really get to me. Here is what I have found, says Solomon the preacher, adding one thing to another to find out the reason which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. He says, I have found one man out of a thousand. They are rare. A real man, you know, a good man. But a woman, one in a thousand, I have not found. That's because you got poor tastes, Solomon. You remember he has 700 wives and 300 concubines. How many women is that? Well, that's a thousand. And he hasn't found one in there. Can I tell you why? Because you were attracted by looks, you were attracted by all the wrong things and none of the right things verse 29 truly this only i have found that god has made man upright but they have sought out many schemes he he looks at the perversion of man and of women and all their twisted things that are going on and his conclusion is sheer disappointment i know that man is from god i got that figured out but when I see so much sin and so much, so many schemes and so much wickedness and so much evil going on out there, I really have to wonder, did this really come from God? That's kind of what he's saying there. Chapter 8, verse 1. Who is like a wise man and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the sternness of his face is changed. A wise man knows how to read the situation that he's going into, and then how to conduct himself accordingly. You know, a wise man, if he's, if he's out there, he's been at work all day, and he comes into the house, and there's a party going on, and everybody's smiling and laughing, a wise man will take a minute 
transform himself you know put on a smile okay we're in a we're in a good mood we're gonna have a you know and he will you know if that's the appropriate response he will respond that way he's able to change his stern face become a, a happy face he's able to fit in if it's appropriate that's what Solomon says and now starting in verse 2 he begins to recommend submission to rulers and to the authorities this is how to deal with those in authority judges police you know people that you have to go through to get building permits or you know governments or whatever it is this is how this is what you need to do verse 2 chapter 8 verse 2 I say keep the king's commandments for the sake of your oath to God <laughs> he says we should show our submission to the government to the king to the to the president to the leaders the judicial system all of that stuff because it's an institution that God set up we may not like them personally I didn't vote for him he's not my president you know whatever it is we're doing we may not like the decisions they're making or or whatever it is but the bottom line is government is usually better than anarchy than no government verse 3 do not be hasty to go from his presence do not take your stand for an evil thing for he does whatever pleases him <laughs> don't do what displeases that person in authority because it may come back to haunt you if you're mad at the police officer for pulling you over and you give him a piece of your mind your ticket may be bigger you know than it was originally going to be everybody else was speeding why'd you pull me oh you know here you go or if you lose your temper when the building permit guy is over you know I want to do this and how come you won't live blah, 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 blah. you'll never get a building permit again right you're not gaining any favor you're actually worsening the situation that's that's Solomon's advice it's good advice verse 4 where the word of a king is there is power and who may say to him what are you doing recognize there's power and authority in the rulership in, in the king and don't challenge him in that you know I just I just put God in that state who can say to God what are you doing why are you doing this to me who's gonna win that argument eh, can't imagine verse 5 he who keeps his command will exercise nothing harmful and a will experience will exercise wow will experience nothing harmful and a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment obedience and respect is the safest policy when dealing with people in authority when you're kind and courteous you don't need to fear displeasing them because they're not going to be displeased with that. You're the first kind guy they've, they've run across today, you know? Verse 6, Because for every matter there is a time and judgment, though the misery of man increases greatly. In dealing with people in authority, take heed to your timing. Timing is important. We all know how this works, you know. The husband shows up after a long day's work and he walks in the house and the house is a mess and the kids are going crazy in the back room and there's toys everywhere and the dishes aren't done and now he doesn't smell any food and the and the thing and he walks in and he trips over a pile of used Kleenex, you know, just trying to get close to his wife and he goes, Honey, now is now a good time to, to ask you if I can go hang out with the boys, you know, down at the bar. You know, timing is is very important you most of you guys know that especially when you're dealing with people with authority sometimes we think they have an easy job oh if I just had that job just had to push papers around on my desk all day it'd be so easy but but when you actually have to deal with people and then all this list of regulations that comes down from them from a higher authority and all of this stuff oh boy the misery of man increases you know so often my wife would come home from dealing with the public all day and she would come in and she would go there was this jerk 
he, he ruined my whole day you know and, and I would hear all these amazing horror stories and I, I just can't believe people act like that but you know I guess it's their right to do that Solomon says it's very easy to walk in and be sweet and easygoing and kind so give your leaders those people in authority a break give them the benefit of the doubt Verse 7, for he does not know what will happen. Who can tell him when it will occur, you know? <laughs> we have to understand they have limitations. Even the greatest leaders have these limitations. They can't see the future. All they can do is take the advice that they have and do with that. And I just think about what's going on in our current crisis. And everybody's pointing out, they should have known this, and they should have saw this coming, and they should have blah, 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 blah. Nobody knows what was going to happen. Nobody could see it coming. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, period. So what they did was they took the best information they had, and they made the best decision that they could <laughs> but isn't it inf isn't it amazing you know has it been a good situation no not good ha has it has it been perfectly worked out no no it hasn't been perfectly worked out can we give them a break yeah yeah I think we can you know we're to be people of grace and faith, you know, talking to Christians, you know. And quite frankly, most of the Christians I see on Facebook are not either of those things. They are not being gracious, and they are not standing in faith. They're standing in panic, and their mouth and their typewriter knows all about it, you know. My soapbox time, I guess. We people we so often place unrealistic expectations on our leaders they should have known they should have seen this they you know good luck with that they'll never be able to live up to that anytime you place somebody on an elevated platform you put them up there so they'll fall off that's that's what you that's what you've done anytime well, government does this other thing, too. Sometimes they will eliminate God, and then they will stand in the place of God and say, Now, I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to bring this, and I'm going to do this for you. And that's also a stupid thing that government does, because that's going to be an absolute failure, because God won't let anybody stand in his place. Anyway, verse 8. No one has power over the Spirit to return to retain the spirit and no one has power in the day of death there is no release from that war and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it he's calling us to live in this peaceful submission towards the government to be respectful towards those in authority and he knows that quite often rulers will use their own position for personal game and to harm others. It's not ideal, but it's better than anarchy. It's better than civil war. That's life under the sun. I'm glad we live life in the sun, S-O-N, right? Father, we uh, just thank you for the opportunity to get through some of your word tonight. And God, we, we just pray, the Lord, that some of this stuff would stick in our grah, Lord, that we would be kind and gentle with people. Lord, that we would understand, Lord, that you created government, you set it up, and you're the one that puts people there. Lord, would you help us to take um, account of this life? Lord, death is complete in every generation. It's going to come and touch us. Lord, do we know where we're going? Do we know why? Do we even know why there's death? Where it came from? What has happened? Lord, you have spoken. Now, Lord, stir your spirit within us. Make that word produce its fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.